So I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, do you hear me? Can you uh, say something in the? Uh, uh, yes, we can. We can see you. Okay. Feeling. Yes, we can. Hello. Obama said, "Wonderful." Uh, very well. Now, as promised, I will try to tell something about a case, which is a clear-cut illustration of the issue of the European Social Dialogue and of a refusal, it's about refusal, of the European Commission to implement a collective agreement, a, a sectoral uh, branch level uh, agreement, although there was a joint request of the signatory parties to do so. I must say that this was something which uh, Ryan Burkusson, uh, whom I already mentioned, uh, would not have liked. Uh, he, <laughs> unfortunately, he died uh, in 2008, uh, so he never witnessed that. But in a book which was published uh, shortly after his death, which is the second edition uh, of his uh, uh, Magnum Opus, European Labour Law, he was talking about the European social dialogue. He was a strong believer of the European social dialogue. And he said, future generations will judge harshly those who allow the historic achievement of an EU social dialogue to wither and die. Uh, and in fact, even um, Antonio Lofaro, his bright pupil, his intelligent pupil, in that book, which I already uh, quoted, was severely criticizing the um, control and, and uh, the domination by the European Commission uh, over the social partners, uh, already uh, checking their representative status, already uh, inducing, pushing it, but he could never imagine, he said in uh, 2000, uh, which was published in 2000, that the commission would have the guts to control, to monitor uh, this European social dialogue on the basis of the appropriate character of its substance. Huh? He could not imagine that one day uh, the European Commission would reject a agreement on the basis of a test of appropriateness or of opportunité, as we say in French. So he's, he, this is interesting. He says, one cannot help wondering what the consequences would be if quite apart from possibly deeming an agreement to be contrary to community law, the legality check, the Commission gave a negative assessment of the substantive choices of the opportunity of the appropriate character. Hmm? And he says the hypothesis seems somewhat remote. He says that in 2000. But in fact, 20 years later, this actually occurred. And this is the story I want to, in the case I want to address with you. And it's the fate of the EPSU agreement, which was rejected, okay, by the EU Commission. There was a rejection um, by the, the uh, Commission. And this reminds us of a deja vu, uh, deja vu, huh? Uh, because, in fact, something similar occurred uh, sometime before when the European Commission was uh, asked to implement by directive the hairdressers' agreement. The difference being that this refusal at that time was not contested by a judicial procedure attacking the refusal. OK, um, and uh, the essence of this case is, of course, about uh, the question what 
are the consequences and what is the scope and the meaning of Article 155 PFEU, which, as I explained to you, in my modest opinion, and definitely in the opinion of uh, my learned uh, friend Brian Verkussen, uh, generated an obligation, an obligation for the Commission. And this was, in fact, the object of case, court case, which amounted to a judgment of the general court, which was then confirmed, I would say, unfortunately, by uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union. Now, um, and I would like to start with a number of preliminary observations. Um, and um, moment, I will I will start with some preliminary observations. Um, then is that the question is, of course, is how we are going to interpret the uh, constitution, how we are going to interpret the constitution, uh, because the whole debate will be about. Uh, what kind of uh, provisions we think are essential? Are these the essential? Uh, are these the provisions giving rights, human rights, fundamental rights to citizens, protecting them against institutions, or do we attach more importance to uh, these um, parts of the constitution, which are just about the powers? of the Commission, the powers of the EU uh, institutions. OK. Um, but this is just a survey, OK, of, I think, uh, the um, uh, what I'm going to say. Let's start with this famous framework agreement. OK. What is it about? What is this agreement about? It's an agreement about something uh, which is uh, just an issue of worker involvement. Worker involvement uh, in a scenario that important decisions are being taken uh, which uh, affect the interests of workers. Okay. Now, we all know that, uh, or I at least communicate this, that the uh, union has a very good record on issuing directives uh, about information and consultation uh, at the level of uh, the community with the issue of the European Works Council in case of restructuring scenarios, transfer, collective redundancies, and in a more general way with a framework directive. So it's probably a field uh, where you have uh, a lot of harmonization of uh, national labor law. But there is one problem. There is one problem that is the scope, scope of uh, indeed uh, this, uh, these pieces of legislation. Uh, they are not applicable to the central administration. So they are not applicable to uh, civil servants. Civil servants are deprived, okay? of such a right to information and consultation, at least it's not guaranteed by EU law. And once upon a time, in 2013, in fact, the European Commission acknowledged in a revision exercise, a fitness check of the framework directive on information and consultation, that there were two problems, that uh, the seafarers were not covered, and that it was also a problem with the people working in uh, the uh, public uh, administration. And therefore, the Commission itself said we envisage a proposal, okay? We want to legislate, and we will ask, we are obliged to do so, social partners to, uh, to negotiate uh, on this issue if they want. Um, and if this is a sectoral social dialogue issue, it is because obviously 
this is only affecting a specific segment of the labor market. So the social partners clearly indicated that they would start negotiations around uh, the issue of the information consultation of people working in the uh, central administration. And they successfully concluded, indeed, an agreement. Um, and they asked in 2006 that jointly that the uh, commission would table a proposal implementing that agreement. An agreement which is not spectacular, it just gives the same rights in the field of information consultation, which are given as well to uh, workers in the private sector. No big deal. Okay. And then the commission in 2018 said, no, yet. You should imagine what this means. Uh, it took the commission nearly, not nearly, it took the commission two years to say, no. Uh, no, we do not want this agreement to be implemented. So the Commission actually acknowledged that there is a problem. There is inequality in the field of information consultation between private and the public sector. Invite social partners to negotiate when they come up with a solution which reduces that gap. The Commission says, well, thank you, but no, thank you. We're not going to implement this. And this, OK, uh, is something new, OK? Um, and the reasons why the Commission uh, said no are not entirely convincing. Huh? Uh, so this is this refusal is, is, is an A4. It's one page. And it took a, two years to write this one page. Uh, the Commission says, OK, um, EU law is not about people working for the government administration or central administrations. Now, this is a lie. This is not true. It is not true that EU labor law, big parts of EU labor law, do not apply to central administrations. Do you seriously think that the law of the European Union in respect of the protection of health and safety uh, in the field of non-discrimination based upon whatever, sex, race, uh, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, is not applicable to civil servants and their uh, employers. Yes, it is, of course. So this remark of the Commission is completely, it's problematic, it's problematic. Then the Commission says, we should not intervene because anyhow, there is already some kind of information consultation in the public service, in the uh, civil administrations. So why should we harmonize it further? Well, in the past, the fact that to some extent there were uh, fragments okay, of labor law in the member states was never a reason to harmonize it. I would say you can only harmonize something if there is something to be harmonized. That's a very strange argument. And then the Commission says, anyhow, the notion of a central administration, what is Scusi, can your your uh, who is talking here? Scusi. Okay. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say, okay. Uh, I wanted to say that um, obviously the notion of what is a central administration, what is a decentralized administration, can vary uh, from one country to another. 
But the point is there was inequality because uh, the point was that uh, information and consultation uh, was not at all present or obligatory in the civil service. And uh, even if the notion of civil service might be different from one country to another, imposing it to the civil service as defined in the member state would reduce the gap. It would uh, in a way, reduce the amount of inequality. So to use uh, equality as an argument, not to do anything, is not entirely uh, convincing. Now, what I suggest here is to, to have a little flashback to the previous agreement, a previous agreement, which also was not uh, acceptable for the Commission, which the Commission refused, refused to implement by means of a directive. And this was an agreement which was already signed in 2012. And it is about something very specific, but very crucial. It's about health and safety of workers. Now, why do I say it's so important, health and safety? Because the oldest nucleus, the oldest part of European labor law, the first field to be harmonized to some extent, was that issue of health and safety. Um, and um, the Commission, well, indicated in what is a communication that it would not, um, during its term, this was a term of Barroso, implement that uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. What the social partners did was to try to understand why the Commission was reluctant to uh, implement that uh, agreement, knowing that this is a little bit of a different scenario because this was not induced bargaining. The Commission has never asked, okay, the social partners to uh, negotiate on this issue. This is the difference with the EPSO agreement. Um, and in fact, the social parties started to enter into a dialogue with the Commission, uh, coming up with another version of the agreement, hoping that this would be then appropriate. And you see how tricky this gets, because you have the impression that the Commission, in a way, is uh, uh, getting involved in a more tripartite constellation, uh, as if it was one of the bargaining uh, partners. But still, after a new version of the agreement, the European Commission continues to refuse implementation. Okay? Um, now, uh, in this first uh, case, okay, of the hairdressers agreement preceding the EPSO agreement, um, we were confronted with the very first refusal in history of the Commission. Um, and the question was, on what basis could the Commission refuse? On the, and I'm, I'm trying to understand this on the basis of the communications of the uh, Commission itself in the past. Okay. Um, now, um, now, it has always been clear that uh, in the past, or ever since the emergence of the European Social Dialogue, that the Commission had the right to refuse uh, to implement and to table a proposal, uh, could refuse to table a proposal on the basis of the legality check. Now, what is the legality check? I already explained it. It is, well, the fact that, for example, an agreement is concluded by a party or by signatory parties which are not sufficiently representative. What that means was explained in the UEAPME case. Or it could refuse to do so uh, when uh, the uh, Commission 
um, thought that the agreement was not compatible with EU law, that uh, the agreement was contrary to EU law, or that the agreement would deal with subjects to which the Commission, the EU institutions were not competent. But the um, in the hairdressers' agreement, the uh, idea um, was uh, that the um, that the Commission could refuse uh, because they didn't like the content. Hmm? They didn't like the content. Now, what um, what happened uh, in the hairdressers' agreement was that the trade unions thought that the new administration, not the Barroso administration, but the uh, Juncker administration would change its attitude. And they were hoping that in the end, okay, uh, they uh, would come along. And this did not happen. So there is this ambiguity on the Juncker that he says he wants to revitalize the European Social Dialogue. But in the end, he never uh, changed or overruled the decision uh, or the lack of a decision in uh, with regard to the hairdressers agreement. And this was heavily criticized at the time by the European trade union movement because Juncker unfortunately said that um, they should deal, they should deal, the commission should deal with serious issues and not with uh, tiny little details. Now, definitely the hairdressers agreement is a, a technical uh, agreement, but it, it's, it's not about tiny little issues. You cannot say that uh, the preservation of the physical integrity, the health, the safety of people working in hairdressers shops is a little thing. It's not important. You cannot seriously say that. Uh, because these people, you might perhaps not realize this, but they are uh, under constant uh, risks of their health because they are standing all the time, which is not very well. Uh, and they are in, in uh, contact with chemical uh, substances, shampoo, soap, etc. So it's very important that this environment is indeed safe. Huh? Um, okay. So this was, in a way, the prefiguration, okay, the prefiguration of the EPSU, of what happened in EPSU, another refusal, but more flagrant, because here the Commission had actually asked social partners to do something. The difference is also that there was a formal decision, much more clear by the European Commission, in a letter addressed to the social partners, even if it took them two years, uh, to say no, um, and, and this already shows a problem in the uh, legal framework. There is in the legal framework, which you can find in the treaty, no deadline. There is no deadline. The Commission can uh, refuse, perhaps, but it, it's, it's not stated uh, when it has to uh, answer such a request. Now, um, the um, case against the Commission, so it is EPSU, uh, the trade union, and uh, a chair of the, of the trade union, Mr. Kaubrian, who is the president of the trade union, to attack a decision of the Commission. The attack was based upon two major arguments. First, and this is the most interesting, challenging argument, uh, there was this thesis that Article 155 of the TFEU, uh, which states that uh, agreements shall be implemented, huh? in French, la mise en oeuvre intervient, uh, this was the uh, statement that this generates an obligation for the Commission to act, to table a, pr a proposal unless there was a problem with the legality. And then, since the Commission had refused, of course, uh, to do so, 
despite a request. And uh, because this refusal of the Commission was not really uh, based upon a legality check, or I would say it was based upon legal reasons which 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 are uh, not not at all convincing. Mm -hmm. um, this would have been sufficient, but of course the social partners, well, Ipsu, Ipsu uh, said uh, we also challenge this decision because of the way it is motivated. Even if we assume, if we assume that there is a freedom to reject, uh, this decision should be based upon sufficient motivations, sufficient reasonings, and these reasons were not given. They were not given. This is a very poorly motivated uh, refusal. And I already indicated that uh, I, I'm not at all convinced by these ridiculous arguments which are given by the Commission. Now, it's important that we go back to what Article 155 says. Um, I already projected this provision this morning, but it indeed says agreements concluded at union level shall be implemented, okay, um, at the joint request. And they shall be implemented according to two uh, avenues. One avenue being, of course, uh, procedures, practices specific to uh, management, labor, re social partners, and the member state, or uh, indeed a, uh, an avenue which is heteronymous, an avenue which is based upon a decision of the Commission, the tables are proposed, which is then adopted by the Council. And the idea then is, of course, that the choice to some extent uh, between these two uh, modes of uh, implementation is with the trade unions with the, and signatory parties, okay, because they can decide to have a joint request or not. Hmm? So the question is. Does this Article 155 indeed generate an obligation? Uh, and um, I also tried to make this point by comparing also this uh, provision with the French language version. French language version says, a mise en oeuvre de l'union intervient. When you say in French, intervient, it means Usually, it must intervene. It doesn't mean it can or might or, or could uh, happen. And because in a legal text, you know, uh, you should try to uh, uh, interpret in a way that it has legal consequences. Hmm? Now, um, if you look to the travel preparatoire, as we say in English, of this. Um, provision. Remember, this stems from the agreement on social policy annexed to the protocol, annexed to the treaty. And these provisions, these agreements, was in a Val du Chess way written by the social partners. The social partners drafting a part of the constitution, the social partners offering a proposal submitting a proposal to change the treaty in the context of Maastricht to the member states. And what they came up with was something less compelling, because they said the agreements concluded at community level may be realized according to the procedures practices, autonomous, or on the basis of a decision. Okay. So the social partners um, explained that this implementation was optional. They said the agreements may be realized and the member states changed this form. Member states 
transform is maybe realized into shall be implemented. Okay? Whereas uh, in French, the de was transformed in uh, intervient. Hmm? So, um, it's a bit uh, strange that um, the general court, it's a procedure to annul an act, it's a procedure to act. The general court um, said, what we are going to do is to interpret this provision on the basis of a grammatical, literal interpretation, taking into account the travaux preparatoire. Now, this is already a bit strange because um, under the rules of the Vienna Convention, you only stick, you only have recourse to travel preparatoire if a, a, um, a literal interpretation, a grammatical interpretation does not make sense. Here they, they combine literal interpretation and travaux preparatoire. And they say, in a literal interpretation, shall does not imply that there is an obligation. La mise en oeuvre intervient does not imply that there is an obligation to implement. This is extremely absurd because, I mean, a, a legal rule is not about sketching potential scenarios. A legal rule is not to say tomorrow uh, it can rain, but tomorrow it also might not rain. That's not how a, a, a legal rule functions. A legal rule generates obligations. So if you say that it does not generate an obligation to, to um, implement, uh, this is absurd. This is completely absurd. Huh? So in order to save, uh, well, their, uh, this impression of sounding absurd, uh, the court, the general court says, yes, but we should interpret this rule as excluding a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, whatever way to implement. So the, 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 the normative content of the rule is to say there are only two ways to implement an agreement. You could wonder what on earth could have been the third, the third the way or the fourth way of implementation. And they say, anyhow, it would be absurd to state otherwise, to state otherwise that the Commission, that, that there is an obligation to, 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 to table a proposal, because then the Commission would be obliged to table a proposal. Yes, of course, that's what I'm saying. So it's a very strange reasoning. And they say, if you read it, it would also, if you would interpret it as really generating an obligation, it will also imply an obligation for the council to accept the proposal of the commission. And it would even force the member states to guarantee, to ensure that the autonomous avenue would, would function. And this would be contrary, according to the court, to a specific declaration, uh, which seems to suggest that Member states don't have to adapt their system in order to allow for this autonomous interpretation. Um, and then um, the general court continues. The general court continues to say, okay, this is the literal, literal interpretation. We will now check whether the contextual interpretation uh, or the systematic uh, interpretation um, will provide a different result. And that's insane interesting, because I think if you look to the treaty, you should not 
and you interpret a provision 155, it's important to interpret this provision in the context. But what the court is doing is um, strange because a lot of provisions were in fact mentioned by the parties, uh, which logically would have had an impact on the interpretation of 155. But the court only considers one one of those provisions only integrates one of these provisions in a contextual interpretation, and it is a provision which is not even stated in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, but which, uh, so it's not TFEU, it's TEU, sorry, uh, it is found in another treaty, the Treaty on European Union. And all the relevant contextual arguments which were used by the parties, uh, referring to the collective autonomy of the uh, social partners, uh, referring to uh, freedom of association, right to take uh, collective bargaining, the principles of democracy and subsidiarity were disregarded. They were not integrated into this concept, uh, contextual interpretation. Hmm? Um, but the court focuses on Article 17. Nowhere I have of the TEU. And now Article 17 um, is a provision which uh, focuses on the role of the Commission. The role of the Commission as the motor, as the driving force behind the, um, behind the European integration. It focuses on a Commission which is supposed to take initiative. And uh, it states that uh, in this field, uh, the Commission cannot be cannot be uh, hindered, huh? cannot be refrained from uh, taking these initiatives. Now it's very strange because this argument is now being used in a situation where the Commission is not taking initiatives at all, but is refusing to take initiatives. So this is an article about the uh, Commission as the motor of the integration. And it is now being used in order to justify that the Commission is blocking integration. And secondly, even within Article 17 TEU, TEU uh, it's clear that uh, there are exceptions to these rules. There are exceptions to these rules normally even when uh, the uh, Commission is initiating the legislative process. And the idea is that then uh, the Commission could be forced, there is some leeway, could be forced to initiate uh, the legislative uh, process. Um, and the point of the General Court is to say, well, this is not a legislative process. This directive is not part of the legislative process, which is very strange. And what the court uh, then does is to treat the other arguments which has, have been advanced by the parties. So arguments saying there is a right to collective bargaining. Pay attention, there's an obligation for the EU institutions to promote the right to collective bargaining, indeed to promote all the fundamental rights enshrined in the charter. Um, the parties have indeed uh, introduced uh, or used the notion of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity means that if uh, social partners think that rules are relevant for their situation and only for the, their situation, that they are the most appropriate persons to judge 
whether these rules should be made. It's an idea of autonomy. Uh, and um, all this is then used by the Commission to say, if you look to these provisions taken in an isolated context, so not linked to 155, they do not necessarily imply an obligation for the Commission to step in and to implement. But that was not what the social partners or the pl plaintiffs were saying. They were saying that the existence of these provisions in combination with Article 155 should imply an obligation to, uh, to act. Now, what I'm saying in my critique, I, I've uh, sent uh, also a, a note, a case note. I will send a case note uh, through uh, Professor Pizzo uh, uh analyzing this case. Mm -hmm. uh, my point is that um, the court is interpreting these provisions which are empowering EU institutions in order to impoverish the substance of the human rights protection, including right to, to take collective bargaining, freedom of association, which is there in the Constitution as well. And in my view, um, if you interpret a Constitution, you should give more weight to the Bill of Rights. That is the Charter of Fundamental Rights, because it's there to protect you against uh, your government. It should not be the other way uh, around. Hmm? Um, and uh, what is also striking is that whole construction, intellectual construction of the court is actually based upon Article 17, TEU, which is in fact uh, in another treaty. Uh, which is not in the treaty where Article 155 is. And Article 155 is specifically about the European Social Dialogue. And it's very strange that this treaty on European Union is in a way giving more weight, whereas it is not a more important treaty. Both treaties have the same weight. And secondly, the treaty on uh, the functioning of the European Union is much more specific because it's specifically dealing with the European social dialogue. Now, it's extremely strange that the general court, the general court says that this directive, uh, which should implement an agreement, is not legislation. It's important they, they tell this because uh, the principle that the Commission has this right of initiative is not is less absolute in case of legislative acts. Mm -hmm. um, and it's astonishing because it goes, it runs counter the intuition of Antonio Lovaro, who said that these directives are about uh, legislation, that the only role the essential partners play is to, to uh, to um, facilitate huh, uh, the adoption of legislation. And it's also a bit strange because the question whether such a directive is indeed red legislation or something different had already popped up in the famous Hatsi case. Remember the Hatsi case? I spoke about it. The twins, the parental leave hmm, of the mother the Greek mother, um, in this, uh, who asked a parent to leave twice because they were twins, in this case, the court had to dwell on the way to interpret a directive implementing an agreement. The question was whether such a directive should be interpreted differently from an ordinary directive, knowing that the text, the most important part of the text of the agreement was something which was concluded uh, on the basis of an agreement and not something adopted unilaterally by a EU institution. And the court in Hatsi 
since uh, that that is not uh, really uh, relevant. Hmm? Um, so the court says that such a directive needs to be interpreted in identically the same way as any other directive. Therefore, the meaning of the parties is less relevant. The original meaning and more uh, importance should be attached to a lexical and even teleological interpretation. By saying that, the Court of Justice of the European Union seems to indicate in Hatsi that there is no difference between a directive implementing an agreement and a classical uh, directive. And it's therefore astonishing that uh, the general court suggests that these directives implementing agreements are not legislative acts. It is astonishing because what you feel, what you feel in the in the in the judgment of the general court is the idea that the role of the social partners uh, could not and should not interfere with uh, the role of the EU institutions, that this would nearly be a threat to the democratic functioning of the European Union. And I disagree with this uh, approach because uh, the collective autonomy, the European social dialogue, should not be seen as a threat to democracy, but should be seen as an enrichment of democracy. Uh, democracies are much more rich when the people, the people can express themselves through their elected representatives in parliament, as well as through uh, the representative uh, trade unions, especially in issues which immediately affect and only affect uh, indeed workers and employees involved. And in fact, in the oldest, in, in, in one of the treaties, uh, which was never ratified fully, but the constitutional treaty, uh, the European social dialogue was uh, referred to. Huh, not just in a title of social policy, but was referred into a preliminary title uh, on the democratic life of the Union. Okay. And in UEAPME, the General Court had in fact stated that we should see these two uh, actors, the, 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 the social partners and the parliaments, the European Parliament, as two expressions of a democratic idea, and that it was therefore legitimate that uh, Parliament could be substituted by trade unions and employers associations, because both of them, and this was a requirement for the adoption of directive, uh, had to be representative. Huh? So the notion of representativeness was considered to be a substitute and a guarantee for the democratic character of the legislative process. So it's very problematic that the general court now, in a way, uh, considers this involvement of social partners nearly as a threat to the democratic process. Now, um, another problem which I have with this reasoning of the, the court, the general court, is that, in fact, the social partners should not be seen as partners who threaten huh, the democratic functioning of the European Union, uh, because in the fact, in fact, in the past, they were the ones who gave credibility and who gave uh, a democratic character and who reinforced the position of the EU Commission. It was what happened under the law that the most weak 
Commission was in a much stronger position to uh, explain to the member states that what they wanted to push was actually based on an agreement between uh, the social partners. And there is a problem, of course, when uh, the Commission gives the impression of only supporting uh, the social partners when they do what they want and is, in fact, uh, not taking into consideration what the social partners do uh, when uh, they express visions which apparently are not corresponding to their political visions. I'm also not at all uh, convinced by the way in which the court, general court, deals with subsidiarity. In, it, in fact, denies. It denies that subsidiarity, as it is fleshed out in the treaty, has this uh, horizontal meaning. You've all heard about vertical subsidiarity. Vertical subsidiarity is about the relation between the member states, okay, and the union. Union, of course, has this idea that uh, if member states can solve a problem, they should solve it. And if that is not possible, that then the union should step in. But there is another, uh, this is a relation between two public authorities. There is another dimension to subsidiarity, more horizontal, is to um, compare and to articulate the functioning of public authorities uh, with the functioning of civil society, of the organized employers and the organized um, employees, especially when uh, rules are produced which affect and which deal with employment relations. And this dimension of subsidiarity, uh, this horizontal dimension comparing what is the role of civil society, what is the role of the state, is much older than this vertical subsidiarity. It was already uh, mentioned, it was already suggested and defended in a papal encyclical called Quadragesimo Anno in 1931. You might not remember it because you were not born, obviously, uh, but in this uh, famous Ita uh, well, Italian uh, encyclical, uh, the Pope insisted on the importance of the role of social partners saying that uh, they should be given uh, some space to decide and they should not be too closely monitored and too closely restricted by the state. And this was issued, of course, this encyclical as a very subtle critique, perhaps too subtle, on the uh, leggi fascistissime, so the fascist corporatist order of Mr. Benito Mussolini. So historically, horizontal subsidiarity is a much older concept and to say that it does not exist uh, is uh, very very problematic hmm? in fact if you read the uh, european works council directive you can see that word subsidiarity at least in the english version is used because there are so-called subsidiary requirements which will come into play when there is no agreement reached between relevant social partners. Idea of horizontal subsidiarity is there. The EU legislature will step in. The EU legislature will uh, argue that rules which it made are applicable, but only if social partners are not able to find a solution. As I already said, I am not convinced by uh, the rejection of, well, by this equality argument, by this equality argument, uh, which is backed up by the court. The commission said this uh, agreement uh, does not stop equality because the notion of civil administrations is very different from one country to another. I disagree with that. I disagree with that for the simple reason that um, the, in the past, uh, dealing with this very same framework directive on information and consultation, the Commission has defended the extension of this directive to seafarers 
with a reference to the principle of equality, as it is enshrined and fleshed out uh, in, in the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. And it's very shocking that the Commission has no, no uh, appreciation for this need to guarantee the right to information consultation on an uh, equal footing. Uh, because the right to information consultation is not just a pity right, it is enshrined, my friends, in Article 27 uh, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Okay? Here you can see the, um, uh, the uh, consideration uh, which the Commission used in one of the uh, in the preamble okay of this uh, in the recitals of this uh, modified directive now what is the problem here in essence and i will try to conclude is that the uh, european union uh, is actually saying we will use you when when we can in order to uh, adopt a social agenda, in order to adopt directives. But when we don't like what you're doing, uh, when we don't want to push legislation, well, we just do not take into consideration what you're doing. And this is especially problematic because it really puts trade unions in a very weak position. Because as I explained, trade unions cannot exercise pressure against employers by mobilizing a pan-European strike. They don't have the means. The only uh, power they have uh, is to bargain under the shadow of the law. Now, if, of course, the Commission says it's not because we ask you to conclude an agreement that we will back it, the shadow of the law will, of course, completely uh, disappear. Uh, and it is important, and it's different from ordinary collective agreements, where indeed public authorities might play a role, because in uh, many, many legal uh, countries, a collective agreement, which is not backed by uh, a specific intervention, still has some binding effect. And the intervention of the government of the authorities is there to enlarge, to broaden that scope of binding. Caso, uh, we are in a different situation. An, a, a collective agreement, included by the social partners, um, probably has no binding effect at all. So it's very difficult to compare it to uh, the national scenario. I could put it otherwise, it is essential that uh, the Commission acts in order to safeguard this dynamic of collective uh, bargaining. The positive thing is that the uh, Commission, the court, excuse me, the General Court has in fact argued that trade unions can criticize the Commission for refusing to uh, implement an agreement, that that decision can be challenged, and that therefore uh, the uh, Commission should formulate its refusal properly. Uh, but of course, the General Court considered that the motivation uh, was convincing, and that it only had a marginal control over that motivation. And I, I tend to disagree with that. Now, the big, big issue, perhaps, um, uh, what happened afterwards is that, okay, the uh, plaintiffs went to uh, the Court of Justice uh, to um, ask a review of this, uh, of this judgment of the General Court. They disagreed. And they thought they were 
uh, fatal legal errors in the reasoning. Uh, the Advocate General did not follow that line of reasoning, neither did the Court of Justice of the European Union. But what is important as the only small positive point in the reasoning is that um, the court uh, said that it's irrelevant, irrelevant uh, to appreciate whether uh, a directive implementing an agreement is indeed a legislative act or not. Because if you look to the general court's decision, the directives, when there are directives, okay, cease to be uh, legislative acts. And this would amount to a kind of a hierarchy between the directives normally uh, adopting uh, EU legislation and those directives implementing, implementing agreements. Uh, I wanted to um, point out that my learned friend Silvia Orelli from the Ferrara University uh, once upon a time asked me to organize a, um, an event, a seminar, uh, which she phrased as a Namikus Curia workshop, which is the kind of event which sometimes is organized by uh, Italian academics when a court is pending uh, before the Corte di Cassazione, hoping to, in, hoping to inform hmm, uh, the uh, court in Casu, this was then the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, about uh, EU law. Um, and that's why I decided to organize this uh, event prior. So between the decision of the General Court and uh, the um, decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union, you, this was all recorded, uh, hoping that it would have any impact on the, that, that was my hope at least, on the uh, court's decision. And it happened, but if you can you can open this um, this link, and then you will see that uh, you will see that uh, perhaps um, you will find other arguments, or other uh, colleagues than me backing the arguments and, and, and criticizing the earlier decision of uh, the general court. Do you have, because we'll go in a little break and then we will talk about another issue of uh, EU labor law. I assume already the right to strike. Do you have any questions at this very moment? Do you have any questions at this very moment? Ci sono domande? Yes. Ben, be my guest. Yes, uh, I would like to know, and this was something that you talked uh, about quite at the beginning, um, the interpretation of the General Court of Article 155. Now, do you also criticize the distinct steps of interpretation themselves, like the literal one, extra material, the systematic one, or only what they did within each step? Yeah. Um, well, it's well. I I criticize everything, of course. <laughs> um, it's it's funny, you know, when the hairdressers' agreement was uh, did not amount to a um, to an to a directive. Hmm? I published with uh, Klaus Löscher and. Uh, Melanie Schmidt, uh, an article in the um, Industrial Law Journal, where we advocated a uh, interpretation of Article 155, uh, generating an obligation. And we use this these categories, okay, like uh, grammatical ex, uh, grammatical. Um, interpretation, uh, 
historical travel preparatoire, uh, interpretation, uh, contextual interpretation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to some extent, these categories were used as well by the general court. But this is where the comparison stops. Hmm? Um, and what I so I don't I I, I think um, there is a great freedom. There is a great freedom for the court to interpret the treaty as it wants, because there are rules in, under international law, um, and these are the rules of the Vienna Convention. Okay. But these are the more default rules. It will not stop a court to develop its own rules of interpretation. But I, I, when I, when I, um, so I think that the, the, the rules of interpretation by the Vienna Convention are too strict. Um, but I also argue that um, the, 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 the way in which the court is interpreting uh, things, um, although it derogates from the Vienna Convention, is not entirely convincing, even if the Vienna Convention is not mandatory. I really have a problem that the court is saying, OK, we are engaging in a contextual interpretation, but that it then, of course, um, uh, defines what context is and what context isn't in a way which is not convincing because in a way it creates a in a very it creates in a very selective way what it considers to be context and uh, then uh, evacuating other arguments which for me are part of the context hmm? um, i don't know whether so the criticism is a bit twofold but yes, most so of it, it, it is it aims at everything. It aims at everything, but perhaps even a bit more uh, within each category, the way in which they they uh, apply this method. For example, I cannot understand that you in, in a lexical interpretation. Say when the text says agreements shall be implemented, implemented in an heteronymous way or an autonomous way that this can mean that they should not be implemented at all. You see, that's not, that, uh, that's for me completely incomprehensible. Hmm? It goes against the normal lexical interpretation of such a text. But that's yes, okay. Fine. Thank you. I mean, thank you very much, Ben. If there are no, Yes, and then we have uh, Giulio Centamore, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Philip, for your presentation. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, you've, uh, you mentioned the Barroso Commission and the Juncker Commission during mm -hmm. your presentation. And I was wondering whether you see a change of attitude uh, with the von der Leyen Commission or you envisage a change mm -hmm. of attitude, maybe after what happened with the pandemic and uh, with mm -hmm. regard uh, to how much was important the social dialogue, you know, in dealing with the pandemic crisis and even after that. That's my, that's that my question. It's a very good, it's a very good uh, question. Uh, Giulio, um, well, I think that the Van der Leyen Commission is definitely a commission which, uh, contrary to Barroso, the Barroso Commission, uh, believes in uh, the adoption of directives to solve genuine problems. We cannot complain about directives which have been launched. Hmm? Um, now, uh, however, however, um, if you look to um, some some uh, communications of the of this from the line administration, they do not 
challenge the idea that the commission has the uh, power to appreciate the appropriateness of agreements and that it can refuse huh, um, the uh, implementation of agreements which have been concluded uh, knowing that there is a request i mean if and and there is there is also now a, there is a new recommendation on on uh, social dialogue collective bargaining being prepared by the commission but this deals more with collective bargaining taking place at national level okay um the 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 the, 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 the commission has never withdrawn its its right hmm, uh, that it can just appreciate um, the appropriateness and has is still refusing let me be very clear is still uh, refusing to implement the EPSO agreement the hairdressers agreement so if the commission would be more credible and not just producing blah blah they would actually uh, take these requests to implement into account and they don't they do not do that okay you see so i perhaps it's a bit better but uh, in the field of uh, discourses hmm? parole 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 but not in the field of concrete action Thank you. You are 100% clear. <laughs> okay, at least I'm clear. You don't have to agree with what I'm saying, but I try to be clear. That's already something. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. So then I suggest that we take a little break and I introduce the following subject, which will be within 10 minutes or so, which will be about uh, let me think, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, the right to strike in the EU. Okay. And I will, uh, Professor Pizzoferrato will send some doctrine which I, which I produced regarding this uh, subject. Okay. Thanks. So 10 minutes break, please. Okay.
Uh, Oké, okay. hallo. Uh, I propose to um, continue a little bit introducing uh, the last uh, subject of the course. Which is about the right to take collective action. Uh, if uh, I have some more time to uh, so tomorrow, I might even add some uh, reflections on, on, on the issue of worker involvement, but we will see where we get. Um, now, of course, uh, this subject is uh, well known, the right to take collective action, and it's a very infamous and EU law, it's very infamous because of two cases which um, were issues to judgments which were issued in Laval and Viking. Okay, the case is Laval and Viking, which date back to December 2007. And uh, these were very um, uh, important cases because doctrine has been produced uh, when these first preliminary references were sent to uh, the Court of Justice, stemming from a British court in the case Viking, stemming from a Swedish court in the case Laval. A more doctrine was produced when the opinions of the uh, advocate generals were issued. Um, doctrine was produced when the judgments were there. Uh, doctrine was produced when finally the Arbeidsdom Stollen tried to apply huh, the judgment in the case Aval to the situation at hand and condemned indeed the trade union uh, to pay uh, damages. damages. Uh, now to the service provider involved. Um, there has have been uh, also uh, a lot of publications surrounding the uh, compatibility of this case law with other international uh, standards. So I must say I'm a bit fed up because I, each time I had to write about this, I'm a bit fed up with it. Uh, but I will try to, to send you, okay, one of the most more important comments I wrote about these two cases. And I want to uh, also to see um, how we can uh, overcome uh, this case, which is in a way an example of negative integration, meaning that uh, the economic EU law is being mobilized in order to downgrade uh, the uh, protection uh, given by social law. That is not new, but in this case, there was a violent attack upon fundamental social rights themselves, because the collective actions which are at stake in Laval and Viking, I will, I will dwell on Laval because I, I don't want to uh, address the two cases, um the critique the critique okay on uh the court um uh, is that of course this is a, a massive attack on, on collective actions which were perfectly legitimate according to the law uh in uh in uh, for example in sweden uh, and according to the law in finland in the viking case but I first want to talk about the right to take collective action, what it means historically, if you uh, address it from the point of view of national uh, labor law, and if you put it into a historical and a comparative uh, perspective. And uh, in this day, I would like also to dwell upon the necessity to get collective action recognized. 
necessity because by its own nature, by its own nature, nature collective actions, especially uh, Schopenhauer you know, strike, are going counter to the logic huh, uh, of uh, legal reasoning. Hmm? Um, they challenge major principles of civil law, and if you want to um, prevent uh, these collective actions from being illegal, you need to recognize something like a right to take collective action. Um, indeed, there are three attitudes which a legal order can uh, adopt in relation to strikes, to collective action, and uh, that is repression. Repression, saying uh, that you, that means that you mobilize criminal law to say that um, um, involvement in a strike action is a crime, or organizing a, a strike action is a crime. Or you can, of course, fully say it's a right. And it even has a political and a constitutional dimension. It's a fundamental human right. And between these two positions, you have a position of science, science of the legal system, meaning that there is no specific provision dealing with strikes and collective action. But because there is something in the dynamic of a collective action which makes it clash with the, the ordinary principles of common law, um, it will imply that these ordinary provisions of civil law will be mobilized to say that it's illegal, not from the point of view of criminal law, but from the point of view of civil law. Now, the question is, who tends to express himself? Which institution tends to express itself saying, OK, it is recognized as a fundamental right. And we, there we don't have a clear cut answer in um, if you analyze um, if you analyze legal systems. Sometimes it is the constitution. Uh, who expresses itself, hmm? uh, the assembly adopting a constitution. Sometimes it is the judge, it is the judiciary, and they have to be very creative because everything uh, in the field of common principles tends to condemn, tends to uh, restrict the right to strike. So it, it, it requires some creativity from the judge. Or sometimes you can even imagine a system, although it's very rare, that the legislator, legislator expresses uh, himself in favor of such a recognition. So taking into account this, this, this knowledge which we have from comparative labor law, it would be interesting to see which institutions, which EU institutions, have taken a stance on the right to take uh, collective uh, action in EU law. First, we start with historical and comparative uh, introduction into the right to strike, just as we try to talk about the collective agreement, okay, uh, in, uh, in a more comparative way. So I said, okay, there is something tricky about uh, strike, Chopin, and uh, the principles of uh, a legal order, because collective actions historically challenge the idea of competition. Competition is extremely important in the EU legal order. Um, but once upon a time, competition was uh, prohibited uh, among uh, proper uh, undertakings, but also among the workforce. This takes us back to times even prior to the French Revolution, but it wasn't reinforced by the French Revolution. There was this idea that workers, called journeymen, could not 
constitute a coalition, coalition, a combination, as it is said in English, in order to exert a pressure uh, against uh, employers or undertakings, which would then um, improve the price they would get uh, for their work or the workforce. It was considered to be uh, a kind of a cartel. Huh? Uh, this was considered to be uh, a falsification of competition, and it was uh, repressed by criminal provisions, just as we tend to repress this now uh, when undertakings are trying to conspire uh, in order to uh, falsify uh, the price, the natural price of their services. Hmm? Um, collective actions uh, usually generate a pressure against an employer who might be uh, restricted to exercise his freedom to conduct a business. Now, you could say I couldn't care less, but uh, because freedom to conduct a business is not really a principle of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, but it is a principle which to some extent exists in uh, constitutions, for example, even in the Italian constitution, but which is always, uh, of course, not um, recognized as a an absolute right. Uh, it's always try, it's always being uh, restricted, uh, it's being subordinated to the public utility, but freedom to conduct a business, don't underestimate it, has acquired a special specific status in EU law because it is enshrined in Article 16 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and it has been used, it has been mobilized to give already a very restrictive interpretation of some EU directives in the field of social policies. And then, of course, the right to strike, if you're really dealing with the right to strike as such, is a bit contrary to the idea of pacta sunt servandae, pacta sunt servanda, sorry. Uh, the right to strike traditionally means that people who have committed themselves to work, but refuse to do so, <laughs> refuse to do so, and uh, suspend their contractual obligations, suspend the exercise of their contractual obligations. And if you incite, if you, if you stimulate people as a trade union to do so, you might uh, generate a tort law um, liability. So there is something in the dynamic of a right to strike, right to take collective action, which makes it clash with, with many, many well-known principles of the legal order. And in fact, once upon a time, uh, a famous French uh, civilist uh, so he was called, uh, let me think, he was called uh, Plagnol, hmm? um, wrote, La grève, c'est un droit contraire au droit. Un droit contraire au droit means uh, the strike is a kind of a, a, a right which goes counter the, the essence of the law. I cannot say it more beautiful than in French. Un droit contre au droit. Because droit means law and right at the same time in French. Now, um, if we look now how this situation has evolved uh, in Europe, European countries, we can see that in uh, some rare occasions, constitutions have stepped in. This happened in France in Italy and in Spain. And it's not surprisingly because uh, these um, countries have known a fascist era in the uh, 20s, 30s, where the strike once more was penalized, huh? was a criminal offense, like in the 19th century. So the criminalization of strikes was assimilated to a fascist attitude 
And in, in these historical uh, critical moments, after the end of the fascist rule, some constitutions were rewritten from scratch. They were withdrawn and they were rewritten from scratch. And in order to accentuate the fact that uh, this was not a fascist era, the right to strike got a political dimension. It was seen as a sign of a free and open society. Hmm? Somebody wrote a book once upon a time saying that the recognition of the right to strike and the strike was a sign of civilization, because in totalitarian regimes, there is no right to strike, whether it's communist or fascist. Though in other countries, constitutions have not yet been withdrawn, was not this uh, uh, fascist uh, fascist um, period chosen uh, by the people themselves, and judges had to step in. But judges need time. They apparently uh, needed more time to overcome this uh, classical clash between the recognition, the idea of the recognition of the right to strike on the one hand, and this, this, this logic, common logic of civil law. For example, in my own country, uh, which is the not so United Kingdom of Belgium, uh, it took until 1981, 1981 before judges recognized the right to strike. Uh, compared to, to Italy, where you have a constitutional uh, reform. Uh, now you must help me. Is this uh, 1948? Uh, can the Italians join in the Italian constitution? When was it adopted? Was that 1948? Uh, yes, sure. You are correct, Philip. Okay, thank you. This is reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> and in France it was 1946, so it's more or less the same, the same period. And um, also in the Netherlands, it was 1986 uh, until judges uh, recognized the right to strike. It's very rare that legislators step in to recognize the right to strike. I'm not saying to limit the right to strike, but to, to, to recognize the right to strike. But that happens, strangely enough, in a country which is not known for statutory parliamentary interventions, and that is the UK, because in 1906, uh, the this is very soon, huh? the uh, judges stepped in to give a kind of an immunity to trade unions if they organized strikes. It's a bit ambiguous because this immunity is only valid if certain conditions are met. And also uh, there was some dismissal protection when uh, Tony Blair, you know, stepped in uh, and on the basis of uh, law of 1999. Now, what about the European Union. What about the European Union? We could wonder which institution, EU institution, played a role in getting um, the right to strike recognized or in adopting a discourse on the right to strike, knowing that there are three potential attitudes. Huh? I repeat it once more recognition repression, and of course, silence. And here we get a very complicated configuration. Huh? But I will start first with the Council of the European Union, where we have indeed a lot of secondary instruments which do not um, recognize the right to strike in an explicit way, which do not really repress the right to strike, but which say that the instruments are neutral in respect of the recognition of right to strike within the member states. So you see, when we deal with EU collective labor law, we can we can uh, wonder what EU, uh, the EU is doing to create a level of industrial relations at, at EU level, but it also deals with or has an impact, potential impact on industrial relations at national level. But in a number of 
uh, EU regulations and directive, it says, okay, this is a, the EU rule, but you cannot use it. You cannot use it to restrict by means of a negative integration, okay, uh, the protection which is given in your own system to that right to strike. It's interesting because it does not, of course, oblige member states to recognize the right to strike, but it just protects their recognition against the effects of such a directive or regulation. So even a country which does not have an explicit recognition of the right to strike could perfectly live with such a directive or regulation. And you see something of that language, which amounts to a kind of silence, a position of silence, although it is explicit silence, in the posting of workers directive, uh, which is now amended, but which says that it is neutral in respect of the right to strike. Uh, you can find it in the services directive, which is also called the Bolkenstein directive, and by people who don't like it, the Frankenstein directive, but I haven't said that. And then you also have the Monte regulation. Of course, this rings a bell to the Italians, so I should explain this. Uh, there was a time when Monti was a, a member of the European uh, Commission, Professor Monti, and uh, he uh, tried to make a regulation. He made a regulation, he adopted a regulation, a proposed regulation as a member of the Commission, which is about uh, the freedom of movement of goods and the idea that um, people who transported goods, who moved goods from one state to another, uh, could not be uh, confronted with obstacles uh, to that movement uh, stemming from private individuals. And in this way, he created or affirmed a liability of the states where to make sure that these obstacles were removed. And this is a codification of famous uh, judgment of the court of justice, the, uh, the judgment called Spanish strawberries. Uh, but it says that this, this cannot be used against people on strike. If strikes as such um, create an obstacle, in the free movement of goods, for example, because people refuse to transport goods, you cannot mobilize the monetary regulation against these people on strike, insofar as that strike is, of course, recognized in the country uh, consent. So that is what more or less the council is doing. It's uh, not recognizing strikes, but it sometimes says that their rules cannot be used against people on strike. And then we go to the issue of the constitutional stance. The issue of the constitutional stance. Um, and there, of course, when well, it's simple to some extent, um, because nowadays in Article 28, we find a clear cut recognition of the right to take collective action, not just the right to strike the right to take collective action of uh, employers and uh, workers. But prior to that, prior to that, uh, of course, there was also, and there still is, this idea that in the Constitution, that the EU legislature has no competence to deal with the regulation of strike, that it cannot uh, adopt rules relating to strike, whether it is to recognize a strike or whether it is to restrict the strike. But anyhow, we have in the Charter of Nice a recognition of the right to strike. The question is, what does this mean? It does not mean that the Charter of Nice once more obliges the member states to recognize the right to strike in their legal order. It does, to some extent, um, mean that the right to strike needs to be taken into account if EU law is being applied.
applied. Now, obviously, this EU law can never be EU law, which is directly affecting uh, the right to strike, which is dealing and regulating the right to strike because there is no competence. But it might be EU law, which is mobilized against domestic recognitions of the right to strike. And there, the idea is probably uh, that uh, a conflict is there. Uh, it's not clear how this conflict should be dealt with, but the cases Viking and Laval are exactly about this scenario mobilizing EU law in order to restrict the protection which is given, which is given to the right to strike in domestic legal orders. Okay. Uh, and the two cases are here of Viking and Laval. And uh, here, of course, the Court of Justice, which is that other institutional actor, um, plays an ambiguous role because it stepped in prior to the entry into force of the Charter, prior recognizing the right to strike, right to take collective action as a general principle of EU law. Bene, very good. But on the one hand, in its own unique way of balancing, it declared a strike, a collective action taking place in Sweden to be illegal, uh, urging a state to prohibit it, urging a judge, a Swedish judge, to prohibit it, okay? Therefore, leaving no, no margin of appreciation to the judge who had sent the preliminary reference. This was the difference between the Viking case where the courts uh, gave rules to the British judge explaining how he had to judge uh, the issue and the legality of the strike and in theory, giving him a margin of appreciation. But I'm not going to talk about the Viking case because uh, it would, uh, well, I, I'm lacking time, so I'm focusing on the case Laval. Now, if we come back, if we come back to what we have learned about the history of, of strikes and strike laws and, and the comparative perspective, we remember, okay, there were three attitudes, and we see all these attitudes present, represented, in the case of EU law, we see something of a prohibition when the Court of Justice stepped in prohibiting the collective action in the uh, Laval case. This is, of course, an ad hoc, a pointillist approach. Uh, we see something of silence, mutism, where uh, the uh, Treaty of the Function of the European Union says, okay, we cannot legislate on strikes, and where some directives say these strikes are neutral, in the, uh, these strikes, these directives, regulations are neutral, and we see something of recognition in the, in the position of the Court of Justice, who, pour la galerie, uh, uh, per la galerie, yes, says there is something as a right to strike, in theory, or where Article 28 says there is a right uh, to strike, it's a fundamental right, part of the charter. So this makes it very complicated because, of course, if you look to, uh, to, to national legal systems, well, uh, it's not so blurry. Huh? You have less institutions who uh, take a stance and it's less ambiguous, okay? Uh, but that's not my fault. I did not create the system. Um, moment. Continuing. Okay. Now, you understand, you do understand that to some extent, there is a recognition of the right to strike, right to take collective action, and that to some extent, there is, there are these economic freedoms. Uh, done uh, to provide services uh, and also 
a freedom of establishment. Now, in theory, they can clash. And this will force a judge, whether it is the Court of Justice or a national judge, to balance it. But in order to get there, in order to reach the point that a judge should really balance, a lot of hurdles need to be overcome. So a judge who wants to balance these two conflicting uh, principles has to take all these hurdles and probably is very determined uh, to balance. And there are ways for judges, and there was a way for the Court of Justice, to avoid uh, reaching that point where it had to balance. For example, the Court of Justice could have said, well, it's nice that there are um, economic freedoms, but we just consider that these economic freedoms are not applicable in a scenario of collective action. Now, you can say that is shocking. It's not so shocking because it did something similar in Albany, which I already referred to this morning. In Albany, there was this apparent clash, uh, or, or there was something presented as an apparent clash between freedom of competition on the one hand and collective agreements. And the court said, well, no problem. Uh, there is no such clash because we consider that these competition rules do not apply to the scenario of a collective agreement. Now, if you want to avoid the class, clash, you could say, you could argue, as a court of justice, a la Albany, in the way of Albany, these economic freedoms are not applicable to the scenario of a collective action. Even if you would have said they are applicable, and this is what the court will say. If you have an employer invoking the against workers, against trade unions, this means that you allow an employer to invoke these economic freedoms against a private individual. Okay? You could argue that this is not possible because these economic freedoms only have a vertical effect and not a horizontal effect. And that you can invoke them against authorities, national authorities, the commission, but not against a private individual. And in such a scenario, you would not come to a point where you have to balance. As you can assume, the court took that hurdle in Viking and in Laval, and it allowed employers to invoke economic freedoms against private individuals such as trade unions, which are not public authorities. I will say how they came to that. And if you want to, uh, to avoid the clash, you could also say, OK, no problem. Uh, there, there, there are these. Uh, there is no immunity. Uh, there is some kind of horizontal effect, but we just consider that in Kazel, um, the economic freedom was not really genuinely affected. The court, of course, took that step and considered that there was a scenario of a restriction of the uh, economic freedom, therefore necessitating some balancing exercise. OK. Um, now, uh, so in order to, to get there, to get to the balancing exercise, you must recognize that there is a right to take collective action under EU law, if not, there's nothing to balance against. You have to uh, accept that um, two principles in a specific case apply, 
no immunity and that there is a restriction okay, of the economic freedoms, which within the uh, logic of the economic freedom cannot be justified. And then, and that it, it can be invoked, okay, by the parties. And then you have to balance. But balancing is a complicated thing um, because um, you will inevitably then, um, you have two choices if you have to balance. You can say, I refuse to balance. I'm going to create a hierarchy between fundamental rights. And this is a very radical approach because it's general. And uh, judges don't like to do that. They uh, like to balance uh, taking into account, okay, the facts of the case. And then there is the principle of proportionality. Huh? The principle of proportionality, which gives a lot of leeway to judges to do what they want, in essence. Huh? But proportionality is, of course, a tricky thing, because when we speak about uh, strikes, we, and when we speak about economic freedoms, uh, there is the risk that you take a kind of a quantitative approach. You associate the exercise of the right to strike with some economic damage, and you try to, to uh, take the amount of the economic damage into account. Um, for example, trying to understand what the people on strike want to obtain. And you have this kind of quantitative balance scheme. And this is not the scheme which the Court of Justice would follow. It has a more qualitative approach to proportionality, uh, whereby the idea is that uh, you uh, wonder whether there is a justified aim uh, restricting the economic freedom and whether um, the restriction of the economic freedom is proportional in relation to that uh, legitimate aim. It's much more qualitative hmm, as an approach. Hmm. Uh, now, I will stop here and tomorrow I will explain how the court dealt in this very high-ranking case of Laval with this balancing exercise, huh? how it came to that point of no return where it had to balance it, and how, in the end, it balanced. Okay? Uh, and, and so I will uh, deal with that tomorrow. I will see whether I have time to insert Viking uh, or not. I'm still I'm still in dubio, uh, but I might have time to do that as well. Okay. Are there any burning questions at the moment? And then I will also speak speak about Monty, not Monty one, but Monty two, uh, another uh, regulation draft regulation to solve this uh, to try to solve this uh, case or at least the the Anise, which this case generated uh, in 2007. Va bene? Okay. Eh, oh, bene, yes, ben, bene, yes. Philippe. Okay. No, 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 no. no. Uh, ben, well. please, uh, please, uh, uh, your turn, please. Um, I actually do not have a question on the topic, but if no one else has, I would like to ask an off topic question. Yes. Um, actually, it's a sort of personal matter, and I wanted to ask you this in person, but since we are online the whole week, uh, might as well ask now. Uh, I'm going to write a term paper um, in this course, 
uh, on digital platform workers. And I've seen mm -hmm. that you've um, published a book with uh, together with Professor Carinci. On I'm not in workers. a position to deny that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, this book is not available for in our university library. And so I wanted to ask you if you would be so kind to, uh, let's say, help fix this institutional failure and um, somehow could manage to make this uh, your work accessible to us. What I can do, I don't know whether we will meet. The, uh, I, I, what I can do is bring, I have the book with me. Uh, in uh, Bologna, I, I can bring it. Uh, I can bring it to the university, but no, no, we can uh, we can uh, arrange uh, uh, in this way. Um, in, we can uh, make a, a, a copy uh, of it uh, for uh, uh, educational purpose for uh, uh, Ben, uh, and then uh, I will. Uh, um, uh, take note uh, uh, of uh, the uh, reference uh, of the book, uh, and I will make a suggestion to our library to buy it. So we okay. achieve we we could achieve both goals. Uh, on the one hand, uh, um, to uh, let Ben uh, studying it uh, as soon as possible, and on the other end, uh, to uh, acquire it uh, um, from the library is it okay I, wonderful that's very very nice i will not learn anything don't worry <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for this idea thank you thank you, thank you for your interest ben uh fine so uh, thanks again uh, philip uh, unfortunately uh uh, we will uh, uh, meet uh, also tomorrow uh, online um, uh, because of uh, the um, persistence of uh, uh, the um, uh, emergency uh, status here in Bologna and in all the region. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so I. Uh, I'll uh, hope uh, to see you um, tomorrow uh, at the at the same at this same uh, uh, link. Uh, of course, all of you. Uh, thanks again, and have a good uh, uh, afternoon to everybody. Thank you, thank you, Alberto. Thank you all. Thank you, Philip. Bye. Ciao. ciao.